Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Packaging Integrity Fail, Think Inside the Box to Ace Your Next Transit Test, sponsored by Oliver Healthcare Packaging and Packaging Compliance Labs, and broadcast by UBM. I'm Daphne Allen, editor of MDDI and contributor to Packaging Digest and Pharmaceutical and Medical Packaging News, and I am pleased to have you with us today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. Our webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. We're trying something new today as well. Our speakers are giving this presentation in front of a small live audience in Grand Rapids, Michigan. To avoid confusion, we are asking all in-person attendees to hold their questions until the webinar is complete. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type the issue into the Q&A area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. Now, on to the presentation, Packaging Integrity Fail, Think Inside the Box to Ace Your Next Transit Test. Our speakers today are Kevin Zacharias, Global Technical Director for Oliver Healthcare Packaging, and Ryan Erickson, Vice President and Packaging Engineer for Com Packaging Compliance Labs. After their presentations, Kevin and Ryan will be available to answer your questions. Now I welcome Kevin and Ryan. Thank you, Daphne, for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here in front of the live audience in Grand Rapids and also uh, over the webinar as well. So to, to start off, I just want to level set uh, the audience because I understand there's a lot of different uh, levels of experience. Um, so we always ground ourselves in the voluntary standard ISO 11607. Uh, so that's that's what we're going to be focused on from the standpoint of, um, if you're familiar with 11607, there's two parts. Uh, we're focused here on part one and specifically section 6.3, uh, where we're talking about packaging system performance testing. So the guidance uh, standard is going to tell us that we want to test and verify the integrity of our packaging post uh, simulated transportation testing and post sterilization. So uh, Ryan and I are both going to be focused on that, uh, looking at failure modes and potential uh, mitigation tactics in that regard. Um, the guidance document is also going to tell us to look at worst case scenarios. So when we go through some of the case studies we're going to run through, we're looking at worst case scenarios with respect to worst case sterilization modes and cycles, uh, worst case product, medical device, uh, and the worst case package configuration and uh, process parameters. So we're going to be running uh, at our worst case or limits within the processing of our packaging components, high and upper and low limits. And then uh, climatic conditioning is, is going to be a part of that as well. Um, and then the shipping and handling aspects as well. And Ryan will walk us through that. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Just to uh, elaborate a little bit further, next slide, please. For uh, climatic conditioning, uh, the purpose of that step is to ensure that we expose packaged goods to um, the different climates that they may encounter during the course of shipping. So for example, um, going from Alaska to Texas to Hawaii, uh, a packaged good may encounter a lot of different types of environments during that process. Um, note for today, as we look at different root cause analyses, we're going to consider that climate conditioning to be a preconditioning step instead of another approach, which is to do transit testing with a box while it is still hot or still cold. Um, that can definitely introduce some interesting dynamics to the behavior of those packaged goods during transit. So we're going to focus on climate conditioning being a precursor and then assume that transit testing is done at ambient conditions. When it comes to transit testing, what we're trying to do is simulate the hazards that a packaged good encounters uh, when it's going through the distribution environment, such as um, shocks, drop, altitude, vehicle vibration, impacts. Uh, we can think about the UPS driver uh, 
grabbing, grabbing a box and chucking it into the back of the truck. Uh, it's funny, at the lab, we see a number of times UPS will come, they'll open our garage bay, and they'll start throwing boxes off the back of their truck into our lab, which you know, we're then going to take those packaged goods and do transit simulation on them. So it's very real. Things really do get beat up uh, pretty, pretty severely during the course of distribution, as many of you probably know from having received damaged goods uh, to your home. Um, and med medical devices go through the same type of uh, extreme exposure. Now, just a quick uh, show of hands for those in the room. How many are familiar with the process of transit testing? Have seen that done in the lab environment? Show of hands. Good. So a lot of the audience here today has. Uh, if we can go to the next uh, slide. What I'm going to do, just for the folks on the phone that may uh, not have had a similar exposure to uh, laboratory transit testing, we're going to show a quick video that's going to walk you through the different steps that are involved in that process. So what we're seeing here is climatic conditioning. These boxes are being put into a climate chamber where they will be exposed to, um, like I said earlier, that sub-zero tropical desert uh, conditioning, the challenge, the packaging, to those extreme environments. Then we have drop testing. During drop testing, the boxes drop from multiple orientations, uh, typically from 24 inches, and there's typically 12 different drops throughout the course of a standard transit test. Um, what's being shown now is compression testing. This simulates the compressive forces encountered uh, during uh, vehicle transport or warehouse storage. This video has been sped up because it, the plant is closed together at a very slow rate of speed, but you can see at the end there the box uh, crushing as those plants close together. Uh, this is vehicle vibration that's being shown, so boxes will go up on that table. They will vibrate. Uh, we'll do multi-axis vibration to ensure the different orientations are covered. And this is concentrated impact. This is where we take a 1.5 pound dart and allow it to slam against the box in all six faces of the box. So if you have product that is resting up against the side of the box, it could become bent or broken due to that concentrated impact. Now after the testing, that's when we go and investigate the packaging that's inside the boxes and determine if there's been a breach of sterile barrier. Uh, we do that with bubble leak integrity testing, amongst other methods. With a bubble leak integrity test, uh, what's involved with that is submerging the package underwater, inflating it with air, and then trying to determine if there's any air escaping from that package, which would tell us that there's a hole in, in the pouch or the bag, or we've got a cracked tray, perhaps a puncture. So this is a video of one of our um, packaging engineers, Sean. He's doing a bubble leak test here. And see that package underwater. Now, the dreaded outcome, packaging engineers, is when a hole or a breach of the sterile barrier is identified in bubble leak testing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. What should you do when you identify a hole? How should you investigate that issue to determine what is the root cause and mode of failure? And then what I think is really cool about this presentation is we're going to show some slow motion footage of the behavior of flexible and rigid packaging inside shipping boxes as they're being exposed to drops and vibration. And we'll talk about how that behavior relates to the failure modes that um, could potentially occur. And we're going to do that by talking about four different case studies, real, real world examples that we've encountered in the lab. And we'll talk about those and how they've been addressed and what are risk mitigation tactics that you can take back to your project work. So interesting uh, bullet point in that slide from PCL is that uh, in their experience, 30%, roughly 30% of transit studies fail with the breach of the sterile barrier. So that's, that resonated with me previously in my career, did a lot of distribution testing, and I think that probably fits about right. So 30% yes. of the time when uh, this study is run, you're, you're going to have a failure. Um, we're going to talk about uh, four case studies, as Ryan mentioned. Um, case study number one uh, is going to relate to a pinhole found uh, in a header bag, and this was, again, post-sterilization, post-transit testing. Here we have, talk about dread, but that dreaded 
a Sharpie marker pen circling something. And, and as a packaging engineer in my career, I would have nightmares about that image. And it's, it's always um, a bad thing. And in this case, we had multiple failures uh, in the corner of the bag. Um, and of course, that's, that's a situation where you, now you have to figure out what to do. You're probably in the 11th hour of a product launch or a cost savings program, and you have to figure out what to do and how to mitigate that issue. So um, it's very important, and you'll see a common theme here in today's discussion uh, about pinholes and, and investigating and almost looking like this as a crime scene, if you will. Uh, I call it CSI packaging engineering. But in this magnified picture, and I really recommend magnification, a microscopic look at some of your defects to understand what's going on. So the nature of the defect uh, is really important. You can see the breach of the sterile barrier here obviously a hole, a hole that failed uh, probably a bubble test, but you start to look around the perimeter of that breach and it starts to tell you a story. And that's, it's really important uh, to understand what's going on. Don't always default to, hey, I had a puncture. Uh, the device must have punctured or something externally must have punctured the pouch or the package film, in this case, header bag. Um, so you want to take, continue to look at it. You want to investigate and you back out in this expanded view, still microscopic, you can see around the pinhole, there are evidence, there's evidence of a lot of flexing and creasing and bending, um, the white striated marks. So it starts to tell you a story that, hey, there's maybe some severe flexing going on um, within the package. And um, it's starting to tell you, hey, well, how, how am I going to mitigate this? So that's the next thing you start thinking about. So as you continue to investigate, and, and again, you're backing out, and the arrows are showing us that there's a lot, of, there's a lot going on here more than just simple puncture uh, of a film. So you can, you can see the fold marks and the crease marks all adjacent to that breach of the sterile barrier. Again, this is evidence of uh, flexing going on in, in, the, in the header bag in this case. And what I always uh, find interesting is if you hold a clear plastic party cup and you squeeze it until it cracks, you get those white stress marks on the cup. Same things happen with, uh, with flexible film, and that's what we're seeing under microscope there. So if we look at this example, in the left image you can see um, the product is a surgical kit in a CSR wrap in a header bag. We've got a large bulky box. We've got excess uh, film material that's being bunched up in the corners. And we have headspace in the box, which provides opportunity for those products to bounce around and lead to flex cracking. Uh, if we can take a look at the first video, uh, the video that I'll show you is not of this uh, particular product. We had to kind of recreate this video footage. We used Tyvek pouches uh, filled with dummy products, uh, but the behavior uh, is going to be very similar. And as we're watching this, what I want you to take away here is look at how those pouches are bending and flexing on the bottom of the pouch during each cycle. Uh, if we look at a different view, we're going to see that the product in this case is a hip stop. And again, uh, take a look at that bending and flexing that's occurring during the course of the, of the vibration. Now these videos have, or, sorry, this, uh, the simulation has not been enhanced or made more severe. This is run to specification. This is Schedule F, uh, repetitive shock for sign vibration. And in this case, we can see that parts bouncing around. Again, notice the, uh, the pouch film, especially on the bottom, is flexing and folding. Uh, that's definitely an opportunity for flex cracking to occur. You'll also notice, uh, you know, right away I see that there's opportunity for abrasion, puncture, a whole host of other types of failure modes that could be present uh, when products are undergoing this type of vibration. Uh, in this case, we know that to be flex cracking for this particular example because of the microscope analysis that was done to understand the nature of that hole, and we could tell that it was related to flex cracking. So a really interesting look at what is going on inside of your shipping case during this, this transportation study. Uh, so we're going to talk through the mitigation tactics uh, for this particular case study. Uh, so we to reemphasize, again, we're, we're concluding that the repeated flexing of the film in this header bag resulted in breach or pin, pinholes in the sterile barrier. Um, mitigation tactics included kind of a two-pronged approach. Material selection was critical. 
the message here, and we'll talk about it in the next slide as well, is that different materials will have different flex crack resistant properties. So it's very critical when you have a flex crack failure to understand the materials at play and how good they are at resisting flex crack. Um, so that's critical. In this case, we also looked at redesigning the pouch. So you can see in the picture on the lower left, the before, and on the right, the after. So we uh, moved from a header bag design to a reinforced pouch. So you could see that um, there were extra strips of material Tyvek and film combined in the problematic areas of that header bag to mitigate uh, the flex crack issue as well. Um, back to the material situation. Uh, commonly used in our industry is uh, a standard ASTM F392. It's a flex durability test, uh, commonly known as the Galbo flex test. We've got a video to show you how that test works. Um, and it simulates, uh, it doesn't necessarily simulate what's happening in the real world, but it's a great tool to allow us to rank different materials relative to their flex crack resistance. So you can see the twisting and turning that goes on. So we're taking a, a film, twisting it. Uh, typically, the standard is 2,700 cycles that you see there. And after 2,700 cycles, we're going to take a look at that film that's been tested and, and use dye to count the number of pinholes that have been created. So you will see that uh, not all materials are created equal when it comes to this type of test. Again, it's not necessarily a predictor of real world, but it's a great way to uh, rank films to give you the best chance for surviving flex crack scenarios. So uh, in the bar chart in the lower left, um, we're looking at the number of pinholes for a couple of different materials, 48 gauge polyester and 92 gauge polyester, two very commonly used pouch films. More is not better in this case. So you're seeing that by, you can go from a, a thin 48 gauge to a 92 gauge, and you're making this situation worse. You're actually getting more pinholes uh, as a result of the study. So that would not be a good mitigation tactic. The bar chart in the lower right uh, is related to nylon. Um, nylon is typically going to be a better flex crack resistant material than polyester. But again, you're going to see that the 60 gauge nylon structure had zero pinholes after 2,700 cycles. 100 gauge nylon, uh, thicker, beefier structure is going to have some pinholes. So again, it's not necessarily don't default to a thicker material is going to be better. In this case, when it comes to flex crack resistance, thinner gauge materials will often outperform the thinner, uh, thicker gauge material. So I think we're going to now move to uh, a second case study. This one is going to involve a pouch. And it's, again, a, we're looking at pinholes here. So case study number two um, was interesting because when you look at the device inside of the pouch, it seems uh, pretty, pretty benign. I mean, a lightweight device, some uh, cable, uh, some forceps, um, really seemed like a slam dunk from the packaging engineer standpoint. But lo and behold, post uh, transportation testing, we got the dreaded uh, black circle. We found pinholes located um, in basically the same area of the pouch with every, every one of the defects. And I forget the occurrence rate, but I think it ran around uh, 20, 25%. So again, the theme here is don't just default to, hey, I had a puncture, I need a beefier film to fix the problem. So we're using uh, microscopic pictures. It's a great tool to understand and do the investigation. Look at the areas around the pinhole. You can, you can see the breach here in this picture. The arrows are, are pointing to um, the adjacent areas around the pinhole where you start to see, you don't really see that flex cracking scenario we saw in the last case study. We're seeing more like scuffs and uh, abrasion points. Um, so the message here is not all pinholes are created the same way. Um, uh, we could also tell with the microscope, and we often look at exit wounds versus, versus entry wounds. So in this one, it's hard to see in the picture, but um, it was an exit wound. So it was something from inside the pouch, so it's probably the device, right? that's working its way and abrading to the outside and causing that breach. And when we took a closer look at the medical device, it all of a sudden became not so benign. So we looked at the area that the abrasion was occurring, and it was that little metal lead component that you see there. And in the lower right, uh, you can see, wow, there's a really sharp edge there to that metal component. And that was abrading through the film and causing problems. It wasn't discovered until after the study, after the 11th hour in the, in the program. And we were able to um, identify that as an obvious, obvious culprit. So from there, um, uh, 
from there, I think we're going to go into some more footage of um, vibration. So when we think about abrasion, abrasion is caused by the repeated um, pressure of the against the film or of a package against the inner sidewall of a carton or box. Abrasion can occur due to the device. It could also uh, occur due to the uh, way that the flexible packaging folds, uh, especially if you get those compound folds where the excess ma material is curled one way and then curled a second way to kind of cram it into the box and, and try to um, reduce the, the size of the box. And if we think about uh, abrasion, we've got one hour where we're doing sine vibration, which is uh, similar to the footage we just um, showed you. And then we've got three hours of vehicle vibration. So that's a lot of time for the product packaging system uh, to be under uh, some sort of vibration, a lot of opportunity for the device and the packaging to rub against each other and cause uh, failure related to abrasion. And here we're just seeing another angle. Um, again, this is two specification. This is not enhanced. And imagine your, your products being inside the shipping box and what's actually occurring inside that box. It's really surprising to see how much motion there is, uh, how much jostling around of the parts uh, that are present. And it's, uh, it's eye-opening to, to see that. So you, you think about that, like Ryan is saying, one, one, a total of four hours roughly on the vibration table. Think about the number of cycles of the device rubbing against the package, the package rubbing against the sidewalls of the carton. Um, really tells a, sta a story. In this case, uh, we concluded, again, that it was that sharp component within the medical device that was abrading through the, through the film, the pouch film. Um, the mitigation for this was to put a simple tip protector over that component. It seemed like the safest route, route for the customer. Uh, so we were able to do that. It's also important to consider materials. Um, materials will uh, abrade differently and have different uh, abrasion characteristics. Generally speaking, the thicker the film or the thicker the material, the more abrasion resistance it, resistant it will be. Um, but you also have to consider the material type because that can influence the results as well. Um, the nice thing here is that uh, a much-needed ASTM standard has been developed, uh, ASTM F3300, which is going to help us, similarly to uh, the Gelbo test, it's going to help us rank uh, various materials, and it's going to use the reciprocating stylus um, to help us do that. So we're looking forward to having that at, at our disposal within the industry to help us rank materials. So we're going to move to the third case study, the third of the fourth. Uh, three or four, I mean, so we're, again, we're focused on pinholes. In this case, it's a uh, form fill seal package. Uh, form fill seal, if you're not familiar with that, uh, is a scenario where we're taking a forming web or a film, we're heating it up, we're forming it into a pocket or cavity, we're loading the medical device, and then there's um, a lid stock that's going to be sealed on top of that. So it's a three-dimensional package. Uh, you can see in this picture the pack. Uh, the pinholes that we were found that were found after simulated transportation testing were generally in the corner of that formed pocket, um, and it was adjacent to uh, an injection molded hub of the device, uh, repeated over and over again. And so, again, it's that dreaded scenario: you're in the 11th hour of a program, and now uh, you've got to mitigate a problem that's been occurring. Um, and I forget the frequency rate in this one, but I think it was, again, probably in that 20 to 30 percent range. So the theme, we're, we're, we're doing it again. We're taking a microscopic picture, and we're analyzing the film in that area. And you can see in the pictures a couple of different uh, pinholes that were generated. And what is the evidence telling you? you? You don't really necessarily see the flexing. You don't necessarily see abrasion ar around the perimeter of the, of the hole. It seems to be kind of a standalone puncture, if you will. So that's going to tell us that the evidence is, is pointing us towards more of a straight line puncture, not abrasion, not flexing. Uh, so it was really interesting from that perspective. And when we think about puncture, uh, there's a lot of force involved to drive a device through a pouch film. And so when we look at the shipping system design, in this example, there are some red flags that jump out right away. First of all, we have the parts that are loose in the box. As you can see, they're not well contained, so they could very easily jostle around each other. Um, there's a lot of open head space in that box, uh, which creates opportunity for those parts, again, to have uh, freedom of movement. And because the parts are metal and plastic, 
uh, they're quite heavy. So when you load a bunch of them into a box, force equals mass times acceleration. It can create a lot of force uh, during, during the drop test. So we just had a couple, couple of clips of uh, slow motion drop testing. If we could play those again just to talk through them. In the first one, what you'll see uh, is flexible Tyvek pouches with a similar type of part inside, a heavy metal uh, hip stem. We're going to see that drop from 24 inches onto the ground. And what I find interesting about this uh, is how much bounce there is after that drop occurs. So the product settles, drives uh, into the sidewall of the film, and um, kind of bounces back up. So pretty severe. Um, unlike vibration, where we might have that repetitive movement that leads to, uh, leads to a hole developing over time with puncture, we see that as kind of the one-shot um, event-related uh, pretty severe hazard. So it, I think it's really enlightening to look at some of these videos. It also is a little bit frightening. Um, maybe we didn't really want to know what was going on inside the box, but it, it, nonetheless, it's very important to, to, to see what is happening, all the, the, the cycles of vibration and, and drop and impact. So for this particular case, um, we concluded that it was a straight line puncture of that device puncturing through the package. We saw that and it's most likely happening during a drop test. Um, so, so the mitigation was to redesign the shipping container to reduce the amount of movement of the package during transit testing. That's going to help you immensely. So when you're, when you're designing your packaging scenarios, it's also important to think about your secondary and your tertiary packaging, your shipping containers, and you want to optimize uh, and reduce the amount of movement within the package because you can see in those videos what kind of things can happen. So other things to consider, you, know, you can do, uh, you can add protective sleeves, um, you can do double packaging, you can do uh, different tactics like that to try to mitigate the problem. Material selection can also be very critical in this scenario. Um, material type and thickness will play strongly into the level of puncture resistance you have in the risk there. So in this bar chart, we're looking at a slow rate penetration test, ASTM F1306, and we're um, looking at the pound force required to puncture some of these films. You'll see from left to right in the bar chart, 48 gauge polyester, really the workhorse of our industry with respect to pouching materials, 92 gauge, a little bit beefier structure, and then on the far right, 100 gauge nylon structure. And you can see there's quite a bit of a difference with respect to puncture resistance when you compare a beefy uh, nylon structure to a 48 gauge polyester. So if you have sharp components, the part of your uh, medical device, um, you really want to consider uh, going to some of those different materials and beef your structure. The fourth example will be a little bit different. This is a semi-rigid thermoform tray with a Tyvek lid. Uh, in this case, we had a large, uh, heavy, clunky device that went inside of a thermoform tray. We observed, I want to say in this one, it was around 60 or 70 percent uh, rate of failure uh, in that that failure uh, we can see in the image on the right is a premature opening of the seal in, in that corner. So we need to ask ourselves, what could occur during transit testing that would lead to seals popping open like that? Um, so from the video footage you saw earlier, uh, vibration, that repetitive movement, maybe, um, but also think about drop testing and that force uh, that the packaged goods encounter when they slam against the ground. And in this case, we've got the large heavy tray. It's placed inside of a carton and then into a shipper. Uh, there's really no cushioning or protection, so that tray is directly exposed to the impact from the, from the drop tops. Um, the footage that we have for this will, will show a rigid tray as well. Um, the rigid trays have some dummy parts inside. And when that box slams on the ground, you can see those parts bounce, a lot of force being transferred to the trays. Here's a side view. A lot of movement of the parts. Now we're going to go back to the first clip. I want to show you on the bottom left, um, the tray that's on the bottom left, uh, look at the corner there, and those nuts and bolts actually pop and blow open the seal because they're so heavy and so much force occurring during impact. And then this next video again, take a look at the behavior of the flange of the tray along the bottom of the tray where it makes contact with the ground. You're going to see that flange flex pretty significantly. 
And so you can see how that might very easily lead to uh, a pop seal or a crack in the flange of the tray, which, are, which is very common. So in this case, we had a heavyweight device com um, combined with stress on, on the tray, especially the flange and the seal area, uh, resulting in open seals. So what we did to mitigate this issue is reduce head space, make sure there's not a lot of area for the, for the tray to bounce around. We also introduced this corrugated nest, which allows the tray to um, drop into that nest, and during a side impact, the nest is what absorbs the force from the drop, and it redistributes that force to the sidewall of the tray and alleviates the stress that was otherwise transferred to the flange of the tray. So that's a pretty cool, pretty cool tactic. Yeah, and, and a side comment with respect to open seal defects, there can be many, many different root cause scenarios. This is uh, one that Ryan highlighted with respect to drop, but you also have to consider um, things that can happen during EO sterilization cycles when the temperatures are elevated and there's a lot of pressure involved getting the gas in and out. Those can be treacherous environments for seals, so open seal uh, root cause analysis should always include your EO cycle. It can include transportation in warm climates, uh, altitude and, and things like that, and uh, the coatings that are used on uh, Tyvek lids in these scenarios, there are many different coatings uh, that are available and they uh, often have different properties and characteristics with respect to their strength at these elevated temperatures. So that's always a consideration when you have open yeah. seal uh, type of defects. And that also shows that seal strength is not always one pound, right? That's big, it's a big conversation point in industry today. How do we move away from this rule of thumb of one pound? And we can see that sometimes we need more than a pound. We have heavy parts um, inside of a tray to contain that and prevent the, the seals from popping open. So design best practices, what can we kind of take away from uh, the footage that we saw earlier? Um, number one is reduce head space. We want to avoid bulk, loose, unorganized uh, parts inside of the box with a lot of open space for those parts to move around. Um, we can also consider reducing weight because force equals mass times acceleration. If we have less mass, we'll have less force. If we can't afford to reduce the amount of weight, then we should consider using shelf cartons, corrugated inserts, or other uh, means of cushioning to try to redistribute those forces. Uh, big, uh, a big uh, point I want to drive home as well around creasing and folding. Um, there's something that we call a compound fold, where we take a pouch and we fold it in one direction, and then we fold it again in the perpendicular direction to try to cram it into a carton or box. Um, that leads to uh, creases, it leads to really sharp points where that double fold occurs. Those points can rub against a carton or a box and lead to abrasion issues. Um, so we don't ever want to fold uh, a pouch in two directions. We also want to think about protecting uh, the packaging from sharp edges, uh, rough surfaces, using tip protectors, uh, sheaths, polyurethane sleeves. And we also want to make sure we're using the right materials. As Kevin said earlier, a pinhole is not a pinhole is not a pinhole. It, it's inappropriate to think that every mode of failure can be solved by going to a thicker, stronger film. As we saw with uh, flex cracking, actually going to a thinner film helps to alleviate that issue. And if you go to the thicker film, it's only going to make it worse. So we want to understand the mode of failure and what that means with respect to material properties. So we're selecting the best material possible for that application. We also want to think about packaging as a system. Just because there's a hole doesn't mean we can necessarily solve it by material selection alone. We can use the most appropriate material for the application, but we also need to consider how that product packaging system comes together inside of the shipping box. Um, perhaps the size, the orientation, the configuration, the weight, all of those are factors in how um, that product packaging system will perform through transit. And, and tying it all together, Final takeaways, and I can't stress some of these points enough um, in my experience. Run screening studies. So if you're a packaging engineer working in a medical device, uh, at a medical device manufacturer, I highly recommend that you do and run screening studies early on in your program. I know you're not always afforded that time, but if you do and can, it's really important to do that. Um, run screening studies, over test, test to failure, understand where the potential failure modes might be so that you can wrap your minds around how to mitigate that early on in the program. And, and like Ryan just mentioned, you can start to look at the packaging system as a whole. You can start looking at the materials, so the potential failure modes, whether they're flex cracks or whether it's medical device puncturing. Uh, you can start to understand those things. 
And another point I really want to stress is have a contingency plan. Don't launch, don't walk down that path of a project um, timeline with only one option. I learned that early in my career. So you always want to have multiple options. You want to run things in parallel. I know there's cost pressure and your, uh, your folks are going to want you to, to march out with the, with the cheapest option, but have other things in your back pocket that you can use in case you do have a failure despite running all the screening studies. So that's really important. Test multiple materials, test multiple designs, do that in parallel. Uh, we talked a lot about materials. Um, educate yourself, use your suppliers, uh, do, use research, um, understand the different properties of materials that are um, at play within our industry, whether they're flexible films, breathable substrates like Tyvek, like paper. Um, you want to understand and, and be able to characterize and rank those types of films with test methods, use science, use data. Um, and then think about the device and the package interaction. We've talked a lot about that as well. Um, injection molded parts that are commonly used within medical devices, um, things like um, clamps and, and uh, syringe barrels and things like that, they can have really sharp edges. So you have to be careful about that. If you have the opportunity to help influence some of those designs, influence them to have rounded corners, not sharp, uh, sharp corners and edges. You want to have that in play if you can. And another final comment is this picture in the lower right-hand uh, corner of this slide. Mold flash has bit me more than once in my career where you think about injection molding processes, often them, oftentimes those components will have cavities that are 32 or 62 cavities, and you can have mold flash in a few of those cavities, and that's a picture of some pretty significant mold flash that you might not consider when you're doing your upfront design and material uh, evaluation, but they can uh, pop up during a transportation study that type of mold flash can easily puncture or abrade through and cause pinholes in, in random occurrences, and it can, it can be hard to figure that out. So if you have the opportunity to influence the molding folks, um, you know, work around those things, round corners, uh, mitigate, uh, mitigate that flash when you can. We talked a lot about using protective sheaths. So if you have problem areas that you can't get out of, use uh, protective sheaths, use uh, tip protectors and things like that to help mitigate risk. So with that, I think we'll turn it back over to Daphne. Questions? Thank you, Kevin and Ryan. Um, before we begin with today's Q&A, please direct your attention to our webinar survey, available on the right of the presentation window. Thank you in advance for filling out the form. And now, onto the Q&A portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, please type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window, or click the Q&A um, icon at the bottom of your screen. If we are not able to answer all submitted questions during today's webinar, we'll be following up after the event. In-person attendees should hold their questions until the webinar has ended. So, um, Here's one question. At my company, I'm getting pressure to reduce packaging, so some of your recommended mitigation tactics like corrugated inserts, protective sheets, et cetera, are going to be a problem. Any advice um, for how mitigation tactics that don't add cost and extra packaging? So that's a, a really good question, and it's certainly a situation that a lot of us encounter. Uh, I would suggest that it's important during the development process to do test to failure studies to understand what the high risk areas are in the package design. So for example, I might think that I need to introduce a sheath or a uh, corrugated insert, um, but if I do my screening studies and I do my test to failure studies, I could find out that uh, my mode of failure is actually totally different. Um, we just had a good example of this come through the lab. The customer was concerned about whether to put a protective sheath on the tip of a device that had a rough edge. So we ran a test to failure study with and without the sheath. And an outcome of that effort was that we identified multiple instances of channels in the because of the way the Tyvek pouch was folded and creased inside of the carton. It ended up being that whether there was a tip protector or not, um, everything passed our true area to focus on was the crease in the seal and the way the pouch is loaded in the carton. So that could be an indicator right there that we can save some money by not introducing extra cushioning. Instead, we need to look at how 
the pouch is loaded into the carton, the size and shape of the pouch with respect to the carton to try to mitigate that other issue that was not anticipated prior to that screening study. Yeah, I think those are great points, Ryan. And, and you know, what I try to emphasize to people is, you know, what is the cost of a recall? So, you know, that's going to far outweigh uh, things you're going to be using for packaging. But there's certainly things you can do with materials, like we talked about, identify the right materials, do the screening studies. You can often uh, cut, cut back and reduce packaging and still have patient safety in mind, and, and that's, a, that's a good approach. But at some point, you, you, have to, you have to do what you have to do to protect the patient and, and keep the sterile barrier intact. Great question. Okay, great. Um, our next question. If you have a pouch that requires a compound fold to fit into the unit box, how should you alleviate these folds and allow the pouch to lay flat without creating excess headspace for the device to move and bounce around? That's uh, another really good question. Um, we've encountered this a, a few times recently as well. And what we've done in these situations is to introduce a corrugated insert inside the carton that serves as a nest to secure the bulk of the product in place while allowing the flanges of the pouch to otherwise rest in a flat position and to alleviate stress uh, onto those flanges. So if you picture a Tyvek pouch with a bulky product inside, that product probably has some weight to it, which is why uh, in this instance, they were looking at doing the compound folding to reduce headspace and prevent that part from jostling around. Uh, but instead, I would uh, recommend that the pouch lays flat and that corrugated insert is put inside the carton to apply uh, some restraints to the product and thereby allow that product to remain secure without moving around, but also to allow the Tyvek pouch to lay flat without that double folding. It is a great question, and we get that all of the time. And, and the answer isn't always perfect because at some point, pouches, the nature of the pouch, and it's a flat 2D pouch, and you've got a 3D product, at some point, you're typically going to have to, um, I, I tell people, don't compound fold with sharp creases, but if you can just do rounded, gent more gentle folds and, and size your shipper carton appropriately, it's kind of a fine-tuned thing, and that's where I talk about screening studies because it's not an exact science to get that down just right um, because at some point you are going to have to have some gentle folding of the pouch and you're going to have to oversize your carton a little bit to accommodate the, the pouch and the product. So that screening studies uh, will, will help you with that and what Ryan talked about can also be a, a great tactic as well. Okay, thank you. Um, do you ever write anything into a test protocol to take into account the miles of vibration and impact that the packaging has endured during sterilization, shipment to a lab, et cetera? Another really good question. Uh, in industry today, it would not be typical to create a study design that tries to simulate the exact number of miles driven and uh, the exact number of, of drops that are occurring only because most of us don't have access to the type of technology uh, to actually map out a distribution channel and create uh, that input to then develop a study design around. So ASTM and ISTA have come up with transit programs that are meant to simulate the effects of the type of hazards that are incurred in transit, not necessarily to represent a specific distribution channel. So we always make sure to tell our clients is make, make sure that you understand your distribution channel. Uh, where is product manufactured? Where does it go for sterilization? Does it then go to a DC and become repacked? Or does it go to a hospital buying group where they're going to put it into totes and send it to the hospital? Could it be returned? We really want to map your distribution channel so that you can make sure the hazards that, are, that your good encounters is going to be represented in, in the study. I just don't have a good way to directly correlate the number of miles driven on the truck to time on the vibration table. So we want to err on the side of caution and be conservative in our study design to make sure we're really challenging um, the product packaging system and, and doing worst case testing. Okay, great. Um, are cracks in semi-rigid PETG trays caused directly by internal stress within the tray? 
Cracks in semi-rigid trays may result from a number of different issues that are occurring. Uh, obviously, it takes a lot of force for a tray to crack. So usually if I see a cracked tray, I'm wanting to understand uh, what's occurring during the drop top. That's usually the first place I'll go, and I'll try to understand the shipping system design and think about the behavior of those sealed trays inside of a shipping box. Um, but it's not always related to the drop test that occurs in the lab. It could be related to uh, a hazard that the product encountered on the way to the lab uh, or some other handling issue. And so a good approach might be to do a feasibility transit study where you are visually inspecting the trays after each step of the transit test process. So do your drops and visual inspection. Do your compression and visual inspection and see if you can identify where in that process the crack is developing. And once you know that, you'll have the information you need to develop a risk mitigation strategy. Okay, thanks. Um, and another question about trays. Do you have any experience with ETO or environmental conditioning causing warping or uh, deformation in semi-rigid PETG trays? If so, can you speak a little further about the case study and root cause? Sure. So we had a project come through earlier this summer uh, similar to the last case study that, that we showed you where there was a, a popped seal in the corner of the tray. The biggest difference is that the adhesive from the lid was no longer transferred onto the flange of the tray in the area where the seal was popped. And so the project team started thinking about the sealing qualification and was there um, some uneven pressure along the perimeter of the seal during the, the course of sealing because that seal transfer was not present on the flange of the tray. Well, after some root cause studies where we did what I mentioned a moment ago, we did visual inspections after each part of the transit test process, we were unsuccessful in recreating the failure and that right away caused us to look at sterilization and climatic conditioning. And we found that under high heat and high humidity, this combination of materials had the propensity to um, have that lid be opening prematurely from the flange of the tray under those unique conditions. Uh, we also observed the tray warping uh, under high heat and high humidity as well. So those forces in combination were putting stress and strain on the lid, causing that lid to peel away from, from the flange of the tray. So it's really important that you look at the glass transition temperature for the plastic that's used in the thermoform tray and make sure that that polymer has a high glass transition temperature um, so that you're not causing that, uh, that tray to become melted and warped because of the high heat it might otherwise encounter during serialization and shipping. But I think generally speaking, it would be from my experience pretty rare for a, for a PETG tray to warp as a re result of the temperatures during an ETO cycle. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of rare. So I, I would really have a hard time understanding how the temperatures that are typical to ETO would cause that scenario. But certainly the comments Ryan made about um, the pressure, um, the, the elevated temperature, the um, possibility of the lid uh, popping off the tray, those things are all, all real. But if I had a ser serious problem with PETG trays warping, I would focus probably in, in other areas to see where that might be happening um, and not necessarily ETO instead, unless it's a very strange cycle. Yeah, it could be in the back of a, back of a truck and sitting outside of a dock over the weekend in a hot, humid environment. Um, the back of those trucks become like an oven when they just sit there and bake under the sun and temperatures can get really hot in the back of those trucks. So that would be a good place to start. Absolutely. Great question. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. Uh, how many worst case situations need to be deployed in packaging performance testing? And this um, attendee offers some examples. Worst case sealing conditions, seal at low end of process window, Worst case, sterilization for gamma, use the production max dose as the min dose. Worst case, shipping configuration, heaviest configuration. Um, and too many worst case situations can lead to unrealistic, harsh testing and overpackaging. What do you think? That's another great question, and it's something that people wrestle with all the time. And I know Ryan has a lot of experience with this, but uh, again, I'll speak for general practice from my perspective in the industry, 
is that ISO 11607 really walks us down that path of we should be looking at all those worst case scenarios that were just brought up and testing to make sure um, that we're going to survive because it's possible that those things could line up uh, in the real world. So it seems harsh. It seems like we're over testing and resulting uh, over engineering our materials and our packaging designs. But in, at least in my experience, I'll let Ryan speak to it, but in my experience, that's really the common practice uh, that people use in our industry. Yeah, definitely. It's all about worst case. I do understand the point about not developing a worst case that is beyond the true worst case that something might encounter in the real world. We really want to be focused on um, the product portfolio, understanding the mix of those products, the mix of uh, the different packaging families. Ideally, we'll be able to create groups of packaging families um, that are otherwise similar except for maybe size and shape, and then within each of those families pick a worst case to test. Um, so that might be the largest and heaviest. It might be a bookend approach where we do the largest and heaviest and also the smallest and lightest, uh, or other, other way to try to incorporate the different um, aspects of, of worst case processing into one study design. Um, one really interesting approach that, that, we've, uh, that we usually recommend that works really well is to do a screening study where you have multiple configurations go through that screening study um, so, for example, if you're not sure what's worst case and you think there's a good argument to be made for three or four or five different combinations being worst case, then package those up, each of those combinations, and bring it through a test of failure study and then assess the type of damage and the type of defects that are resulting as a conclusion of that study. And then you'll have objective evidence to say configuration B was absolutely my worst case because I got a lot more failures here than I did on configuration A, C, or D and furthermore provides you with the rationale that you could use um, in if you were ever audited. Why did you choose this worst case? Well, we did this engineering study, and here's the evidence to show that configuration B is absolutely worst case. And, and I'll tell the, the uh, attendee that asked that question that the trend I see is that we're trend is towards doing more, even more worst case, beyond worst case. <laughs> yeah, well, that's worst, true. Worst, worst case. So um, I think it's just the general direction in our industry is to um, – take that approach. But it's a great question, something to wrestle with. Okay, excellent. Um, what is the optimal way to determine seal strength on a sterile barrier system after successful completion of the transit study? Oh, this is something that industry is wrestling with right now. Uh, there is an ASTM working group that's being headed up by one of Kevin's colleagues at Oliver Healthcare to answer that question. Um, and I, I can kind of speak to the approach that is uh, being examined in that working group. And that is to, first of all, optimize your sealing process. So we do that by walking the process through a low energy state up to a high energy state. For example, starting at a low temperature, a, low, uh, a fast dwell time, increasing the temperature, increasing the dwell, and taking seal strength measurements as you walk up that process, and overlaying on top of that visual assessment of the seal quality as well. So we could have an overseal condition, we could have an underseal condition. Um, it's not all about strength of the seal, it's also about the aesthetics of the seal. And from that, we can create a seal curve and we can identify our optimum time temperature and pressure settings, and from there we can create our process window to know what our low and high is of that process. Then when we do our transit testing, we build samples at the limits of the process, so low and high. We would verify that that product packaging system can survive the distribution environment while maintaining a serial barrier. And then we can uh, analyze the, the strength of those seals statistically to come up with uh, a lower tolerance limit uh, that makes sense for that application. I think the recommendation in the working group right now is to use something like minus three standard deviations. Um, in the past, we've used the one-sided tolerance limit calculation by using a K value that relates to the confidence and reliability target for the product line. There's probably a few different ways you could apply statistics to it, but it's definitely best to base the determination of the lower spec on the output of the process at its worst case limits that have been shown to pass transit. So it's not just one pound? Not just one pound. <laughs> but an ASTM F88 is really the common testament. Yes, yeah. right. Good question. Okay, great. Um, 
here's a question from an attendee about pouch integrity failure where the foil acts also as the oxygen ingress barrier. Are there any additional considerations beyond the ones presented so far? Could you please repeat that? Sure. Um, it's about pouch integrity failure where the foil also acts as an oxygen ingress barrier. Um, are there any additional considerations beyond the ones presented so far? Well, I think, you know, obviously in that scenario, you've got a medical device that's either oxygen or, sen or uh, moisture sensitive. So you've got the foil pouch in play to provide that type of a barrier. Uh, and so it, it's, to me, it's, it's very, it's a similar scenario. So the, the moisture or oxygen ingress through the seal, um, we're still employing the same types of integrity testing to verify that um, bubble leak and dye penetration. Um, we're using the same types of um, mitigation tactics with respect to um, material selection. There's other things that are going to be in play. So you know, if you talk about or think about shelf life um, relative to moisture and oxygen, that sealant layer, the seal, the sealant layer, how thick is that? How, um, is moisture going to ingress through a, a thicker layer or a thinner layer? Those types of things need to be looked at. Um, you can do barrier testing. You can do whole package barrier testing with respect to oxygen and moisture. So you would, in my experience, do a lot of the things we've already talked about, but with the addition of the oxygen, oxygen and moisture um, type of testing, whole package testing. And, and yeah, I would say the, the dynamics and the approach are similar to what we talked about earlier, but Foil is a very challenging material to work with. Uh, it's definitely prone to flex cracking, be easily punctured. Uh, it, it's just a very, very difficult material to work with. So I would use the same tactics we discussed earlier, but I would also look at other types of materials to provide um, the same environmental barrier. And I'm sorry, I don't remember if it was oxygen or moisture, but there are other type of film structures and multi-barrier structures that can be employed to achieve a high barrier while also achieving strength in um, in the foil uh, or the or the film alternative, so I would have some some discussions with your um, material vendor. Maybe look at some other vendors and see if there's some other uh, film technologies out there that may be better suited to the application. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you both so much. That's all the time we have for questions today. I know we have a few questions left, um, but we will be following up after the webcast. Um, and thank you, Kevin and Ryan so much for your presentation. We appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you to our sponsor, yes. Oliver Healthcare Packaging and Packaging Compliance Labs, as well as to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. Within the next 24 hours, you will receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to the presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may have not been available to listen to the event. This webinar is copyright 2018 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned and copyrighted by Packaging Digest and Oliver Healthcare Packaging, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. Thank you for your time, and have a great day.